Welcome to Dementia Friendly Prince George's County, Maryland Northern Sector Webinar Series for Caregivers. Today's topic is Creating a Safe Home Environment for Seniors, sponsored by Prince George's County Government and the Department of Family Services. Good to be with you guys this evening. Um, I imagine if you're signing on, this is a topic of interest to you. Uh, and uh, somebody asked me today when I told them I was preparing if I was going to take my uh, monitor and walk around my house and show, show you how to do it. And the answer is absolutely not. I'm, even as I was doing this, I was thinking, well, my house isn't particularly safe in some ways. So we're all going to learn some things tonight. Uh, let's see. Oh progressing there we go so the, my goals for this evening is that we would recognize the challenges of creating a safe home environment uh, with the caveat that it is not safe for everyone to age in place uh, and we all most of us want to stay in our own homes as long as we can we can usually uh, extend that time and make it make the time that someone's at home safer but I'm not promising you that, gee, we can make a way for everybody to stay safe at home. Um, we will look at the essential activities that happen in the home because that's important as we think about safety. Um, we're going to discuss safety adjustments just for the general senior population. And then we're going to also look a bit at the particular challenges of creating a safe home uh, when dealing with cognitively impaired individuals. Um, be sure if you have questions to put them in the chat because I think sometimes that's where we learn the most is by people's uh, bringing up uh, specific situations that opens up conversation. Um, so when we start with recognizing the challenges, I think one thing we need to think about is sensory change and while a cognitive impairment is not necessarily a part of aging or a, no, a part of healthy aging. Um, our senses do that we each rely on, they, that provide us information about the world around us and also about what's happening in our homes. As people age, it is typical that our, the acuity of our senses, of our hearing, of our vision, of our taste, even our smell and touch may dull and they can provide us inaccurate or diminished information. And those safety challenges are going to vary depending on which senses are impacted. Some people have neuropathy and touch is a big issue. Uh, uh, my own mother lost her sense of smell, which presented significant issues with determining whether she was safe in her home. And obviously visual changes, uh, hearing, taste, whether somebody's you know, bad food, do they recognize that food is bad? So those are some of the challenges we start with. Also, uh, we're looking here at just mobility. When you just talk general health issues can impact somebody's ability to stay in their home, but in particular mobility and falls. And there are lots of signs to watch for that can indicate that somebody is uh, starting to have some health problems that might need to be monitored. In particular, when we're talking about physical safety, you look at balance issues. Does someone seem to be unsteady? Is their gait a little off? Uh, do they have difficulty getting in a chair or out of a chair? Uh, are they take, is it slower for them going up and down the stairs? And have they had a fall? Even minor falls are an increased risk. And I know I myself had a fall coming, up my, coming in my front door not long ago and I thought, okay, she's getting older. Uh, and we just have to pay attention to those. One in four seniors fall every year. That's 20%. And one, um, no, that's not one, that's 25%. But 20% of those falls results in a serious injury. And older adults are treated in the emergency room for a fall every 11 seconds. And one fall doubles your chance of falling again. So that's important to think about. Here are the top five causes of falls, and these are important as you're thinking about home safety, um, impaired vision. So their, their solution here, um, and I'm just gonna go through this little slide kind of quickly, is 
adding color and contrast to identify things like grab bars, handrails, knobs on appliances, uh, important things, power buttons, um, medications. You need somebody monitoring, you know, getting all your meds from one place because they can interfere with each other and be causing uh, weakness and uh, dizziness. Uh, just general weakness and lack of mobility. Their solution there is regular exercise. And boy, you know, if all of us would just regularly exercise, we would all be living healthier and longer. Um, home hazards, you know, adding grab bars in the bathroom. We're going to go into this a whole lot more later. But these are the, you know, the causes of falls. And then chronic conditions, you know, Parkinson's, people who've had strokes or have other health issues more likely to have a fall. I'm going to just move on from that slide. Top 10 tips, remove trip hazards, install grab bars, uh, keep frequently used items within reach so you don't have to climb on the stairs. I had a client one time who we realized that the light switch over her dining room table was only, you know, because she turned, I guess it was a ceiling fan, and she turned it on and off by getting on a chair and reaching up. It's like, okay, you're 84. I don't think this is the best way for you to be turning your dining room light on and off. Her kids didn't even realize it. Um, making sure there's adequate lighting in the home. Uh, repairs, wearing sensible shoes. All of these are just basics, vision, extra security. We're going to go into some of this a lot more, but I just kind of wanted you to see that um, there are simple tips to uh, prevent falls, which clearly makes your home safer when you've done some of these things. Um, another important thing to talk about as we're looking at home safety are the activities that we're doing in our home. And those uh, can be referred to as your ADLs or your activities of daily living and your IADLs, which are instruments, inst excuse me, instrumental activities of daily living. These represent the, uh, the skills you usually need to, to be safe in your home. And as you evaluate a home, you need to be thinking about the individual's ability to perform their ADLs or their IADLs. And is there something we can do in the home to make it safe? So while I can talk about home safety, you're going to know the individuals that you are considering this for. Um, and their ability to perform these ADLs and IADLs are going to impact their ability to live at home, regardless of how physically safe all the changes you make. If somebody can't uh, take their own medications, then they're not safe alone at home. If they can't make a phone call and call 911, they're not safe at home alone. Um, and so we can do all kinds of things, but if we can't mitigate their inability to perform certain tasks, they may not be safe at home. A um, little more on ADLs, that your activities of daily living would be the basics, toileting, bathing, feeding, dressing, uh, grooming, walking, transferring. That means from bed to chair, chair to bed, um, that kind of thing. Um, and then your IADLs, and this is not a complete or exhaustive list, but these are things that are necessary for people to live independently. Um, and that keyword is independently. With support, there's a lot of these pieces that um, people can still live alone if they've got support. Uh, can they manage finances? Or maybe somebody's managing that for them. Can they handle transportation? Can they drive or use public transit? And we've got lots of seniors who maybe could be more independent if they could use an Uber safely, but maybe they can't figure out how to navigate the computer to use an Uber. That's an instrumental activity of daily living. Shopping, uh, preparing meals, using the phone or other communication devices. And I will say right here that even people who can't use the phone could use a, uh, like an Alexa or a Google Home and, you know, say, call, you know, call Susie. And Susie knows, but, but some of those devices will not make 911 calls. Um, medic managing your medications is an instrumental activity of daily living. Housework and basic home maintenance or, and, and yard work could be an instrumental activity of daily living, or that could be something that um, in, in any of these cases, it could be something that's farmed out. That is, you know, you've got your yard maintained, so then you're not worried about that. Or you've got somebody that comes in and cleans once a month, you're not concerned about that. Um, or 
cleans every week if you've got a little more money than I do. Um, whether you can operate your television, that was a big deal for my mother. She had macular degeneration. Cell phone would have not even been on her horizon. But uh, she had one grandchild that she was absolutely convinced uh, knew how to operate the television because she had succeeded one time when she got off of her satellite service. This one grandchild got her back on and nobody else would do for her after that. Had to be that one particular grandchild. But, you know, computer independence in our day and age, particularly in the pandemic, uh, is another thing that is an instrumental activity of daily living and can prolong independence. Uh, let's see what else. OK, so now I'm going to talk about how to evaluate your home. Um, and this is just evaluation. I'm not talking about changes yet, just the things to look for. Um, so you can get out your little handy paper, make a to do list probably going to be kind of long, um, but home safety assessment, the first thing we're looking at is accessibility. So we're talking about uh, are there railings to get into the home? Uh, if, there, if there are steps up, are there railings to help them get up the stamps, steps? Is there a ramp? Is the yard an adequate grade so that they can get, say, from the driveway up to the uh, entry to the home? Is there access from the driveway or the garage into the home that is um, accessible for them? And uh, I have it, for instance, in my garage from the person who lived here before me, there is a grab bar where I come up from my garage into the house. It, I don't know that I've used it other than when I had a broken ankle and it was really handy then. But that can, you know, just that ability to make it two steps into your home safely can prolong independence. Um, interior and exterior doors. And these are just things you go around a home and you're gonna evaluate. Gosh, do any of these doors stick? Do the locks work? Is there's an alarm on the home? Is it working? Do we need it to work? Um, and then just in general home maintenance status, is the yard being well maintained? That's not on here. But you know, you want your bushes cut away so the house doesn't look kind of abandoned. Uh, is there adequate lighting? Is the sidewalk or the steps, are they safe? Is anything crumbling? Uh, I've been in homes where the, where the railing is really shaky or there's a brick missing on the steps. Uh, all of those things are things you need to look at when you're looking at home safety. Uh, you want the home to look lived in. And I'm dealing with somebody now that's talking, she's talking about selling her car. And I'm like, well, great. You don't need your car. I applaud you for choosing to stop driving. But is your home going to look vacant? Is it going to invite, uh, you know, somebody to break into a, what appears to be an empty home? That's something to think about. Uh, more on home safety. I think we need to look at the windows. Are they accessible? Are they reachable? Can somebody open them if the house gets hot or cool? Um, in the event of a fire, can they, can they get that window open? Are there curtains near any heaters? And that's a concern as well. We don't want any fire risks. Um, lighting, uh, do we keep the curtains open in the daytime? Is the house well lit? Are the switches for the lamps and the ceiling lights accessible? Are they, you know, somebody having to get down on the floor to or pull their way down a cord that's hanging to find the switch to turn the light on? Maybe that cord needs to be replaced or the switch needs to be replaced. Or maybe you need a new lamp uh, or a better lamp. Uh, that gives you more lighting. You also want to be looking for clutter or tripping hazards, and those can be throw rugs, area rugs, electrical cords, sharp edge furniture. And then in addition, the, how many homes I've been in where particularly as people are losing their, um, some of their mobility where mail gets stacked up, magazines are stacked on the floor, gee, there's some boxes and they just kind of start accumulating. And before you know it, they've got many tripping hazards around them. So um, those are things to look for. Uh, moving on, in the kitchen, a uh, significant area where uh, home safety needs to be addressed. One, uh, one place we start is this, does the stove have knobs that this person can operate? Can they tell? Can they see well enough to know whether this is actually on or not and which burner is on? Are they storing things on top of the stove that really should not be stored on top of the stove because if a burner gets turned on and they're storing, and I saw this just last month, they've got their mail stacked up on their stove and they were like, I never used that burner. Well, that's great until you do. Do they keep sharp objects put away? 
Um, do you have um, hazardous utensils? Which reminds me of a story I will just skip right now, but things that, that maybe the senior doesn't need to be used are chemicals. Are they secured? Are they stored elsewhere so they're not mistaken for other things? Um, here you need to test and not just assume that mom or dad can still use the microwave or stove. We've got these microwaves that are you know, often above the stove and it becomes a difficult reach. And this is what I was thinking about today, but it was in my laundry room. So I use my microwave with no trouble. I can see it. I have a stackable washer and dryer and I'm well aware that if I get, well, when I get old, I guess, or if, uh, and my mobility, if my mobility decreases, this would not work for me because for the top one, which is the dryer, for me to choose my cycle, I have to switch it down several lows and then count back to the load I want because I can't always see the light because it's too tall for me. And for my washer, things get kind of stuck in the drum sometimes and I'm like practically standing on my head to pull these things out. It's what I have, I'm fine with it now, but at 80, I wouldn't be wanting to use that washer and dryer, I don't think. Um, the other thing is looking for food storage and expiration dates on food. When we people lose their sense of smell or vision and they're looking at something and they don't know, they can't read the expiration date, they assume it's fine. My father-in-law, after, after his wife died and we were down there helping him clean out the kitchen, we found all kinds of things and as people were opening them, we had one can that literally exploded because it had been in there so long because he wasn't cooking after his wife died. So we just cleared all the food out and let him go out to eat. Um, moving to more general areas of the home, does each level of the house have a working smoke detector? And then can this person turn it off? And as we talk about cognitive things later, does, do they understand what that smoke detector going off even means? My mother, who did have dementia, and we lived about five doors apart, she called me one day, and there was this blaring going on in the background, and I could see her house from mine, and I could tell right away that was a smoke detector, and you can bet your bottom dollar I'm looking out the window to see if my mother's house is on fire. She didn't even, couldn't communicate that she had called me because of that smoke detector, and uh because, of course, as I said earlier, she had lost her sense of smell. And I said, Mom, is that the smoke detector? And she said, maybe so. And I said, well, is something burning? And she said, I think I burned a piece of toast earlier. Well, this is like 11 o'clock in the morning. I don't know how long it had been since she cooked her toast. But you want a working smoke detector, but you also want to know that, that this person knows what to do if the smoke detector does go off, that they can dial 911. Um, does the home have a working uh, carbon monoxide detector? That's another thing. And let's see where we're going from here. Um, are there easy to use fire extinguishers in the common rooms of the house? Has the furnace been inspected? Or how long has it been since the furnace was inspected? Are the towel racks, bath mats, and handles secure? Um, and I think we say somewhere in here further on that a lot of times a good thing to do is just go ahead and replace towel racks with grab bars because they are more secure. Um, have burnt out light bulbs been replaced? Are there poorly lit places in the house where a smart light or motion sensor could be installed? Uh, are the laundry lint traps cleaned? And that means not just in the washer, but the, the exit. Uh, tunnel, I guess, for lack of a better word, if that's, if, it, if, if the laundry room is far from the exterior of a house, mine goes about 15 feet to get out of the house. And uh, it was, we could see when we went to clean it out one time that it had kind of, some of it had kind of burned in there. So you want to take care of that. Are there funny smells in the house? Are there signs of hoarding? Is there a lot of trash around the house? Um, are there doors and locks working properly? Let's see, so this is you now with your big long list of concerns, but we're gonna try to address them a little more precisely as we go on so that you can make an appropriate list. Um, so in the bathroom, and um, I think I say this later, but I'll say now, you just start somewhere. 
you cannot do all of these things at once. If you want to create a safe home for yourself or somebody you care for, you start with what seems most important. You prioritize. You're not going to need to do all of these things for everybody. Um, so in, in the bathroom, installing bright lights or motion sensitive lights so that when they go in at night, the light just comes on and they don't have to, you know, decide they don't need a light and end up having a fall in the bathroom. Remove throw rugs. Now people really have trouble with this because they feel like the throw rug is gonna cushion their fall, which it's really not. And unless you really secure those rugs, <clears throat> excuse me, they are much more of a trip hazard. Here's where we say replace the towel rack with a safety bar. Uh, <clears throat> add safety bars to the shower or tub um, and around the toilet area. Provide a bench in the shower and a handheld shower head. Add an elevated toilet seat with the grab bars. Use non-skid bath mats, you know, those suction ones in the, uh, in the shower or the tub. Mark hot and cold clearly. Some faucets have the red and the blue, but there are ways that you could mark them. Another important thing is setting that water heater to 120 or below, because if they've got really hot water coming on them and they can't move quickly enough to get out of the water stream, they could be burned. Uh, on this thing was have it on my list that I was looking at, because very little of this clearly is my own, like I just made this stuff up. These are from lists I find here and there, but people say have a cordless phone in the bathroom um, or some kind of an emergency safety device. Um, so before I go on in the bathroom safety tips, I had wanted to insert a slide and I, I overlooked it. So um, this is where I might turn on my camera. Let's see if I can figure out how to do that because I talk with my hands. There we go. Can you guys see me? Yes, and we can. Okay, great. So by a toilet, you want a uh, horizontal bar, and then you want a vertical bar a little further out. So if I was sitting on the toilet, I don't know what you can see, but a little further, the horizontal bar would be right next to me, and the vertical bar would be a little further. So the horizontal bar is going to help me get to my feet, and the vertical bar is going to help me stabilize. When you walk into a shower, you want a vertical bar just at the shower door or shower entrance so that you have something to grab on as you step over the ledge. Uh, and you want a horizontal bar on that back shower wall so you have something to hold on to if you're feeling a little wonky. Also, as I said on that last slide, adding a bench or something like that. Now for a tub bath, which are not particularly recommended for people who have mobility issues, um, I, I don't think I can even describe the picture that I have here. So I would say, um, let me go back to the shower. You would put in two horizontal bars. You'd have your vertical, you'd have a horizontal on that one wall and a horizontal on the adjacent wall. Um, the, the tub, uh, I would say if you have a tub bath you wanna make safe, you're gonna do some looking because I don't think my description is gonna do you any good here. Okay, let me turn off that camera. There we go. Okay, now we're going to move on to. Oops. Oh, I'm on the wrong screen. Let's see. Oh, what happened? Camera came back on. Sorry about that. Technological uh, difficulty for me. So, kitchen safety. You want to clearly mark the on off position on all appliances. And for people with low vision, they make these things that are like little bump kind of stick on buttons that you can use to mark the uh, like the off position for say an oven for somebody who has some visual trouble. And these are things that can, um, they're not gonna solve all the problems, but they can delay uh, having to do something, you know, make a move or whatever for somebody. It, somebody who's cognitively sound and can feel the bump and you can even put bumps around at different degrees for somebody. Um, uh, who has the cognitive ability to kind of follow all that. But you clearly mark the on and off position on, on your appliances. You store your cleaning products separately from the food. Um, some of this we talked about earlier. Check the expiration dates. Keep the floors and counters free of clutter. Sharp things like knives should 
uh, be in some kind of a rack, not just loose in a drawer, because now you're talking about somebody reaching in um, who may not have a good sense of touch or sight, and they're just reaching in and grabbing a knife. Um, and then you can use auto shutoff timers on, on stoves, ovens. Uh, a lot of people will get on the electric tea kettle because it will just automatically shut off. Um, a number of these kind of devices um, of various types are certainly available online. You can also go um, also online or you can request a catalog to the Alzheimer's store. And if nothing else, it just gives you good um, ideas for things. I had a, uh, a pad that would, if somebody got out of the bed, an alarm would go off, which was helpful to me when I had somebody in the home that was wandering. So you kind of just don't know what little device might be helpful to make things safer until you look. Um, and then after you find it on the Alzheimer's store, you, you buy it there or go looking for something similar elsewhere. Uh, let's see. So, okay, in the bedroom to, um, Make that safer, you may need a handrail for the bed. You certainly want the phone and a good light um, accessible. You might want a, um, like I said, a light in the adjacent bathroom that automatically comes on. You gotta try to minimize clutter, which is, um, you know, getting any senior who, who likes to keep a lot of stuff to give up stuff is a challenge in and of itself. Um, make sure the drawers don't stick. Make sure that the clothes that are in the room are the appropriate season and are accessible. Um, as the weather changes, you know, you might find mom, uh, first of all, mom is probably colder than typical as people get older, that's common. Um, but people with cognitive issues will go outside not dressed appropriately for the weather sometimes. So you wanna make sure that the right clothing is available and maybe, you know, put the sleeveless things away in the summer, in the winter time. Um, the other thing to think about is whether you want to remove the lock from a senior's bedroom and bathroom so they can't accidentally lock themselves in and you end up in a panic situation. Uh, I don't know what that was gonna be, but oh, there's my bathroom slide, uh, which is not where I expected it. But if you'll look at the tub there on the lower right, um, you'll see that those grab bars are, there's like a couple of horizontal grab bars uh, to the side. There's one as you get in, there's one above the shower, but still it's got to be somebody pretty strong to be able to get up out of the tub. But some people really want to keep taking tub baths, so that could make that a possibility for them. Um, okay, so now, start. this is where I was going to say, just start, pick something that needs to be done in your house, in your mom's house, wherever it is. Starting somewhere now is better than starting somewhere later. So putting it off is not gonna make the task any smaller. And um, you just have to figure out which things are important for your home and your loved one. Um, let's see, we've got some more things we're gonna talk about. Oh, so here are some inexpensive changes that are pretty easy to do. Most of them you could probably do yourself or maybe have you know somebody in your circle do for you. Put in brighter light bulbs or motion sensitive lights. Uh, bring in a fire extinguisher, put a smoke detector on each floor. Remove or tack down the movable rugs. Do not uh, apply non-slip wax. I don't know anybody that waxes their floors anymore, so probably should have canceled that one out. Uh, put non-skid treads on steps. Um, particularly, you know, steps that are slick or, or uh, hardwood steps, having a non-stick tread on that. Um, using rubber-backed mats, which we've talked about. Uh, remove and secure area or throw rugs. We already talked about that. Um, more inexpensive changes. Take the wheels off of chairs. So people who use rolling um, I had a client who had all the kitchen chairs were on wheels, but as you have a hard time sitting down in a chair and keeping it steady, those wheels need to come off. Um, same thing with office chairs. If somebody is having those issues, um, add textured strips in the bathroom and shower, uh, put a waterproof seat or bench in the shower, replace standard doorknobs with lever handles, and that can make a big difference too as uh, people with arthritic hands or neuropathy being able to operate the door knob can be a problem. 
uh, replace a toilet seat with a raised or high profile toilet. So you can put in an actual ADA porcelain toilet or you can get some of these um, either a commode chair that, that kind of sits on above the toilet or a seat that is actually installed onto the toilet that's higher. Um, use rubber backed mats. Anything that you put on the floor, use a rubber backed mat. Another inexpensive change are the grab bars. So we're kind of going over the same things, but I'm trying to get you to understand some of these are, are easy changes to make. Um, then we get to more costly changes and installing grab bars could be costly if it is something you can't do. So you would need to hire somebody to do that for you. If you need to alter the shower for a walk-in or roll-in shower rather than a step over entry, that's gonna be some money. Uh, creating zero threshold entryways, which is important for somebody who's um, in a wheelchair or maybe somebody with Parkinson's, somebody for whom mobility is a big issue. Uh, they make these zero threshold entryways and it really does reduce the risk of tripping and that kind of thing. Um, moving light switches for somebody who's in a wheelchair or in a bed so that they're not up. Um, in fact, in newer builds, I think light switches are often a little lower, but they can be out of reach for somebody who's in a wheelchair. Uh, widening doorways and hallways or reversing doorways so that you can uh, have a bathroom door that uh, opens outward so that you can get a wheelchair in and still be able to help this person. You may need to reverse a doorway or add a ramp to the entryway of the home or install stair glides so that people can access more than one level of their home. Um, I know, let me see where I'm going here. Yeah, so let me stay on more costly changes. The other thing to understand is that some changes to your home will be tax deductible. And that kind of depends on if it's clear that it's necessary for the person who's living in the home or receiving care. And does it, uh, whether it adds to the value of your home. If it is something that actually adds to the value of your home, like say you're regrading the front yard or something, then it's only gonna be minimally tax deductible. You would need to talk to a tax person as you do this, but um, some of those things are tax deductible, but there, there are some uh, limitations on that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, okay, so now I would like to talk a little bit about somebody with cognitive impairment and how that impacts home safety. So one thing is you want to use, uh, like for your countertop appliances, things that have auto shut off features or install uh, where your uh, gas valves or things are kind of hidden. Um, I was looking at something recently where there was a timer and if somebody didn't stay right at the stove working, then the timer would cut the stove off. I had a, uh, actually it's not a client, but a friend recently who um, came downstairs and his dad was having some cognitive issues, but dad wanted to um, prepare breakfast for the family that was all in town. And when the son came downstairs, he found that dad had brought a little armchair over kitchen chair, I guess, type thing over to in front of the stove. He had all the gas burners on and he had taken the caps off. So the flames were just shooting up um, and the house was full of smoke and it was very alarming. So being able to have some some shut off valves for somebody who's not able to be reasonable about when or how they use the stove. Um, you can also unplug a uh, an electric appliance from behind the wall, like a stove. Um, putting finger guards on garbage disposals, putting blenders away so nobody sticks their finger in a blender. Um, and then uh, you could put cover switches on things that you don't want them to operate, like say the garbage disposal. You can put safety locks on, uh, on an oven that you don't want someone to operate, that kind of thing. Uh, you can lock the drawers and cabinets that contain knives, can and should. For somebody, somebody, it depends on the level of cognitive impairment, but at some point you may need to lock up cleaning supplies and knives and certainly medications because you don't want somebody taking medication more than is prescribed. Um, more on cognitive impairment and apparently I can't type. So you want to secure garages or basements that may contain those chemicals or other machinery. I've known people who want to keep using 
uh, you know, men who are into woodwork who still want to go out in the garage and do their woodworking, but they're really not safe doing that on their own. Uh, you want to make sure the locks on your exterior doors are out of sight, either high or low, or use deadbolts to prevent wandering outside. Now, people with dementia will uh, will often walk um, kind of looking down. So I always suggest that that lock, you know, like a slide lock up high can be enough to slow them down or putting a um, an alarm on the door so that you just, you hear something as they go out. And a lot of people's um, home safety systems, home, home security systems will have those alarms. And it's just helpful to know, oh, wait a minute, I heard the back door just to go after them. Um, many seniors who have cognitive impairment will not wander, but you really don't want to count on that they won't wander unless they're truly immobile because um, there's always the first time and you sure don't want that to happen. Um, and again, remove this is removing locks from their bedrooms so they don't panic. And, and as I'm going through this list, I'm hoping you guys are thinking about the person that you're caring for or imagine caring for. Um, and thinking about some of the things that you could do to your own home to make it safer uh, in advance. Let's see, more on home cognitive impairment. Um, making sure there's accessible lights and night lights throughout the home. And that would be, you know, for somebody walking down a hall or wandering, making sure that lights will come on as they move around if there's somebody who's up at night by themselves. A covering mirrors is one. I, um, I had a client who was absolutely persuaded that his over 90 year old wife was having an affair because he kept seeing this man in his house. And I am pretty confident as I thought about it later, he was probably seeing himself in the mirror because he probably didn't recognize himself. He didn't look like who he thought he should look like. So sometimes you just have to cover a mirror if, if this other person is distressing to someone with cognitive impairment. Um, create clear paths and open areas that help encourage independence and social interaction because isolation is a big problem for people with dementia. So uh, that's, that's, I guess that's a bonus. That's not really home safety, but it's keeping them happy at home is helping it to be easy for them to interact with people. If they're in a in a recliner off in the corner and it's not easy for them to move around, it's gonna be hard for somebody else to come sit next to them and interact with them and also hard for them to mobilize from there to say in the dining room where everybody else might be sitting and eating tonight. Um, so anyway, that's that. Okay, so um, this was really just a slide to remind me to talk to you about technology. And there's so many new things out there, things that dispense medication automatically. Uh, there's these, as it says here, like a medic alert. Uh, there's senior friendly cell phones. There are the home, uh, Google Home or uh, Alexa. There are GPS trackers. Um, in fact, I have a friend whose husband has dementia and she he took off one morning in the car before she was even out of bed. But fortunately, he had taken his cell phone and she had a tracker set up in that phone and she was able to find out where he'd gone. But uh, I don't even begin. Technology could be a whole workshop all on its own. But those are important things for creating and building safety is to think about um, what's available. Video monitors, um, monitors where you can um, observe someone on your cell phone when you're not even there to see if they're safe. Uh, and, you know, all these home rings, who's at mom's door? Um, you can set that up. I think it's called a home ring or ring or whatever that thing's called. Um, moving along here. So, so this is just to say that safety at home is multifaceted. Like I said in the beginning, we're talking about the individual setup. We're talking about community. Some of your community services can build safety in the home. Um, and also just society, well, like right now, we're all safer in our home than we are out because of the pandemic is often the way it's felt in the last, you know, 13, 15 months. But safety at home is not just what you fix at home. It has to do with the individual. It has to do with your family environment and what you can provide to help someone be safety at, safe at home uh, and so on. Let's see. So 
just to kind of review, we can't always make home safe, but we can almost always make home safer. You want to be sure to assess the situation and then you want to be sure to reassess regularly because uh, aging is not where people are growing more independent. We're usually increasing independence and, and it can change. And with every change in health status, it's time to make that walk through the house again. And maybe every six months, make that three to six months probably, make that walk through the house again and reassess, is this safe? Is there something I can do while I'm visiting? Or is there something we need to do here to make it safer for someone who's living in our home? Um, and the other thing I would say is research alternatives in advance. And I mean, gee, if we're gonna need a stair glide, let me think about that now. So I'm not making a decision uh, in a crisis. Somebody's gone in a hospital and now suddenly they're coming home and they won't even be able to get to the bathroom without a stair glide. Have those alternatives researched. The other thing is, research the alternatives to living at home <clears throat> so that you're not again in a situation where you're making decisions on a dime but you are informed and being informed is really important and even if you don't see something you like as far as options go you'll be more informed about what those options are and you know whether you need to keep looking